Hello again. Today's video lesson is about prejudice. Hopefully you have followed my directions and already completed the rest of the lesson on prejudice, including having watched the Eye of the Storm documentary. Um, in that documentary, it talks about this Iowa teacher named Jane Elliott, who created a simulated in-group and out-group in her third grade classroom, and then watched how the children treated each other in a discriminatory manner in order to teach them what it feels like to experience discrimination, right? It's a really powerful lesson for the kids. Um, Jane Elliott is one of my professional heroes. I strive to be more like her, um, to be as brave as her and as professional and powerful of an educator as she is. Um, so I wanted to take this moment to teach you a little bit about the cognitive roots of prejudice, psychologically where it comes from, um, or what things can influence it. Um, so first, let's define prejudice. Prejudice is an unjustifiable, usually negative attitude towards a group of people and its members. Um, prejudice isn't always with negative beliefs about a group, but the vast majority of the time it is, right? Um, and another key point here is unjustifiable, right? Um, it's not unjustifiable to assume that the person at the top of your class is smart, right? That's not prejudice. Prejudice is when it's not based on something from actually getting to know a person. It's not justifiable, right? It involves stereotyped beliefs, so beliefs that are sort of over-exaggerated, over-generalized about a group of people, negative feelings, and a predisposition to discriminatory action. Note that prejudice and discrimination are not the same thing, right? Prejudice is a set of beliefs and attitudes. Discrimination is when you actually treat people differently. Discrimination is a behavior. Prejudice is an attitude. So that's an important um, distinction to make because you can have people that are prejudiced and like keep it a secret and don't act on it, right? I'm sure everybody has met somebody that is that way, right? Myself included. Um, so some of the cognitive roots of prejudice. One of them is the sense of in-group and out-group and the in-group bias. So the in-group is us, the people you have a common identity with. So for me, in-group might be teachers, and for you, in-group might be students, right? Or adults and teenagers, or it can in-group and out-group can be racial or based on gender or some other sense of identity, like um, being fans of a certain band, right? The out group is them, everybody else, somebody that doesn't fit in or is apart, separate from the in group, right? So I think the names in group and out group are pretty obvious, right? Um, the in group bias is the tendency to favor your own in group and to have a prejudiced attitude or a negative attitude towards the out group. Um, we use generic terms like this because you can have prejudice regardless of how big of a percentage of a population any particular group is. So saying minority and majority isn't really that helpful from a scientific standpoint. That's why we say in-group and out-group, right? Um, so another way to define prejudice is that it's influenced by the in-group bias. We have a tendency to favor our own group and to treat people in the out-group in a lesser way. Um, even think of this as being fans of a thing, like if you're fans of a certain band and then you have meet people that aren't fans of that band, you might not form as strong of a friendship with them or you might want to not want to talk to them as much um, or care as much about what they have to say. That's in-group bias. It doesn't have to create deeper prejudice feelings, but it's an influencing factor on those feelings. Does that make sense? Um, another thing that might influence prejudice cognitively from how we think about the world is scapegoat theory. This is the theory that prejudice exists because it's an outlet for anger by giving someone something to blame for their problems. Scapegoat theory is used a lot to try to explain um, political movements. For example, some researchers think that the Nazis used scapegoat theory to try to blame Jews for the economic frustration that resulted from the end of World War I. So the Nazis sort of deliberately did this. They turned the Jews into scapegoats. Um, there's a quote that's attributed to a Nazi leader, which I tried to figure out if this was really a quote that was said or if somebody just made it up. And I couldn't find concrete proof that it was said, but I couldn't co find concrete proof that it wasn't. So that's why I say attributed. I couldn't really validate it for certain. Um, but the quote it reads as follows. If the Jew did not exist, we should have to invent him. So basically the belief in the Nazis was if we can create this scapegoat, this group of people to blame for all the problems in Germany, 
then we can give everyone an outlet for this anger, right? So if there's some theory floating around out there that scapegoating is one reason why prejudice exists. It's that somebody, people feel the need to have somebody to blame for their problems and often who they blame is somebody in an out group, right? You can even see it in other political movements, not just the Nazis, right? That there's always, I won't say always, that's a mistake. Um, frequently, political leaders will pick some group to be mad at um, and sort of incite their followers to also be mad at that group of people, thus creating an outlet for anger and frustration. But what it ends up doing is creating prejudice and discrimination against that out group that they're blaming for things, right? Like just categorically saying, well, it's the fault of the, you know, the 1%, the rich people are to blame because of all of society's problems. Maybe, right? But that's a little bit of an oversim oversimplification uh, and it kind of is scapegoating, which then can lead to prejudice. And I'm not, I'm sure you can come up with some more examples on your own. I'm not going to list them ad nauseum. Maybe it would be an interesting intellectual exercise. See how many examples of scapegoating you can find in the news. Watch the news for like half an hour and see how many different examples of scapegoating you can find. Um, but that is one theory that the prejudice comes from scapegoating, comes from needing an outlet for frustration. So it could be anger bias, could be influenced by scapegoat theory, could also be influenced by categorization. This one is a little bit more abstract of an idea. But when we talked about cognition in December, we talked about concepts and prototypes and how we tend to form concepts for groups of people, right? And then you'll have a prototype for that type of person. And then if in your prototype, you have these critical features that sort of define, here's how, you know, here's all the feature criteria that some object or person has to meet in order to fit into that category. Well, if those critical features are full of biased, like stereotyped things, then the whole concept you have for that group of people is going to be biased and stereotyped. And then you kind of, every time you see that type of person, you make all kinds of negative assumptions about them. It's called representativeness heuristic. We talked about that a long time ago, that this was the cognitive source for stereotyping. It's also a cognitive source for prejudice. If you have a bunch of sort of racist, sexist, or other sort of prejudice beliefs built into your concepts for different groups of people, then every time you see that kind of person, you're going to make all kinds of assumptions about them because you're categorizing them automatically in a prejudiced way. So at this the tricky thing here is that we all do this, right? Every single person thinks in concepts and prototypes. We all have mental representatives for different groups of people. And most of us, I hesitate to say all because I'm sure some really, really moral, like wonderful person exists in the world, but the vast majority of humanity has some stereotyped things, some biases, built into their concept categories for different groups of people. These are called implicit biases. You're not probably not even aware of the biased ways that you think about different groups of people. And so then when you see the, a person that looks like they fit that concept, they fit that category, you make some assumptions about them unconsciously. We all do it, everyone, right? And there's no way not to because it's built into how we think about others, how we categorize information in the world. What you need to do is try to catch yourself doing it, right? Try to think, oh, I thought a biased thing about that person. Let me not act on that, right? Because there's no way to avoid implicit biases. The only way you can, thing you can do is try to mitigate that with your actions. Um, there is, in the lesson for prejudice, there is a link to some implicit bias tests. I want you to take at least two. And try to be brave and do the race one, okay? I know it's a little scary. You don't want to take a test and have a test on a computer prove that you're a racist. That's not what implicit bias means, right? Everyone has implicit biases. Everyone. We all do, right? The Dalai Lama, I'm certain, has implicit biases. The trick, what makes a person a racist is how they behave, how they treat other people, right? So... Being aware of your implicit biases only makes you more powerful. It gives you more ability to combat those biases, to try to be a good person by treating people differently and making sure you catch yourself 
when you think something negative about someone else. So want, I want you to go take those implicit bias tests. There's like a dozen of them on the webpage. Take at least two. Try to be brave and do one that scares you or makes you uncomfortable. The whole way we learn and change our schemas about the world is by being uncomfortable, right? So try. There's no consequences. Nobody's going to look at it but you, right? So go for it. Um, another cognitive root of prejudice is called a vivid case. If you have really extreme examples or cases of things, they get more easily incorporated into your mental categories, which leads to um, stronger stereotyping. This is based on the availability heuristic. So if you remember availability heuristic, what that means is that we tend to assume information that's more available is more true or more likely, right? So the best example or the example I'm going to go to for vivid cases is 9-11. Um, so on 9-11, terrorists who happened to be Arabs crashed planes into the World Trade Center, knocked it over, and killed thousands of people. After 9-11, a whole bunch of people started doing really racist and prejudiced things to people of Arabic descent in the U.S. and around the world, but we're going to stick to the U.S., right? This is an example of availability heuristic in vivid cases. There was a vivid case of people who happened to be Arabs doing a bad thing. Then people saw that and went Arab equals terrorist and started treating everyone they ever met who happened to be of Arabic descent or even look like they were of Arabic descent. For example, a whole bunch of people started treating Sikhs in a racist way. Sikhs are not Arabs, right? The two, Sikhism and Islam, have very little to do with each other. Um, and they're not even from the same part of the world. But Sikhs got treated with uh, racist sort of prejudice action anyway um, because of this vivid case of 9-11. So that, that case stuck out in people's heads and got incorporated into their beliefs or the way that they categorize groups of people and that vivid case then, then created a massive increase in racism towards Arabic people. Um, the final cognitive root of prejudice is the just world hypothesis and we talked about this one before too but the just world hypothesis is the idea that we tend to believe that there's a sense of fundamental justice in the world, basically karma. Um, and this isn't always conscious either, but basically people tend to believe that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. So if a bad thing is happening or a group of people is suffering, we tend to, all humans, by the way, tend to assume that that bad thing is happening for a reason. That group of people must have done something to deserve it. Um, and usually this leads to victim blaming, where the victims of a crime or the victims of some sort of um, social bias or discrimination or something else get blamed for it. Like, oh, well, you should have done something differently or you should have acted in a different way or you should have not said that particular word or whatever. And then that bad thing wouldn't have happened to you. Right. So that can lead to victim blaming broadly, but it also can lead to increased prejudice, people treating um outgroups people that are sort of socially ostracized or don't have as many social privileges as someone else, um, treating them badly or assuming they've done something to deserve the poor social position that they're in um, because of this unconscious belief in justice in the universe. So all of these things together kind of influence the likelihood of people to behave in a prejudiced way. And that's why prejudice is so pervasive all over the world. There are different groups of people that treat each other badly because of demographic differences, things like gender or race or age, things that people can't control, that they get treated in a discriminatory way. They get people think prejudice thoughts because it's so easy to fall into that trap because of how our cognition works. So it's sort of an unfortunate um, side effect of human cognition is that we're built for speed right? Our brains are built for speed. And so sometimes that speed means that a bunch of negative stuff gets built into our thinking and then reinforced by stereotypes and sort of confirmation biases and us deliberately overemphasizing certain information and ignoring other information to reinforce the beliefs that we already have. Um, and it sucks. And the best way to avoid it happening is to be aware of it, right? Be aware of your own implicit biases and try to catch yourself before you treat someone differently because of who they are. Uh, and that's it for our video lessons on social psychology. I hope 
you have learned something from this unit. I really enjoy teaching it. It's a shame that I didn't get to do it with you in class. I had a bunch more simulations and other little things we were going to do. I've done my best to make your lessons, your digital lessons on this topic interesting. I hope you've enjoyed them. Um, we're going to do a little bit more review for the AP exam after this, and after the AP test, we're going to spend the rest of the school year on mental health and disorders. So don't worry, I'm not going to ignore that unit. It is coming back. Um, I will teach it. I just want to help you get ready for the exam first. Um, take care, everybody. Bye.